All right. Well, this was another really fun episode. Great conversation with the Gear Brothers, Darren and Jeff. They are screenwriters for the new action horror movie, The Retaliators. We had on the star, Michael Lombardi, and now we go deeper on this film with the Gear Brothers, the screenwriters, and we're going to discuss how they got into screenwriting, some of the deeper issues of the film, the soundtrack, future sequels, and more. So coming right up. Don't go anywhere. All right, so how are you guys doing? The Gear Brothers, why don't you, uh, I'll let you introduce yourselves for the people who can't see you. Yes, I'm Darren Gear, And I am Jeff Allen Gear. Okay, and together you're the Gear Brothers and you made a movie and we're going to talk about that and uh, some of the other stuff, you cool stuff you guys have done. Um, so I guess it kind of starts out for the movie business. I mean, obviously you guys grew up with movies and stuff, but right. uh, Darren, you started in acting. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to ask you, I know people ask you about Hocus Pocus and bring it on again, <laughs> but the one that, the one that I wanted to ask about was bachelor trip because I mean, that's like an all-star cast. Is it not like Christopher Walken, oh, Robert oh, Wagner, yeah, Morgan yeah. Fairchild, R yeah. Rutger Hauer, and uh, what's her name? Christina Lacken, Lake, the girl from Lakin. Step by Step. Lakin. I know. I know. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's funny. Uh, yeah. I, 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 that the, First of all, to have worked with Rudger Hauer, like I can't even explain what that meant to me, even at that age, because uh, I mean, I always say uh, two, the two best villains of all time are Roy Batty from Blade Runner and uh, 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 John Ryder from The Hitcher. You know, it's it's Ooh, it's yeah. just he. You know, he, he that, that guy is such a legend and he was the coolest guy. I got to hang out with him for uh, for months on this island. Uh, yeah, I won't comment about the film, the quality of the film. But uh, yeah, I was uh, I was in a movie with. Yeah, it was a lot of great people there. Christopher Walken was was uh, it was a, it, another real treat. He was a complete character and I got to spend a lot of time with him. He played my father-in-law in the movie. So pretty much all of his scenes were with me. And uh, he, he oh, was wow. the, the crazy stories you hear about him in interviews. I got to experience it and it was a hundred percent as quirky and, and kind of funny as, as you would imagine it to be. What like he's is he telling a story like about a watch like in Pulp Fiction kind of quirky or what? Yeah, you know it. it yeah, what was that? What because you have a great story. Yeah, about it was it, there. So he he was there when he came to the island. It was obviously a really big deal. Everybody was was um, freaking out. I mean, because it's he's you know he's such an icon. He's so singular. So like just he he kind of you couldn't not be starstruck around him. Um, because he's so Christopher Walken. I mean, there's no, that's his, that's <laughs> right. his hair. That's his voice. It's him. It almost would feel like it's like an impersonation because there's so many. Yeah. To, uh, completely, completely. And, and so he was very to himself, very private, very quiet. And he ate alone, uh, every day. And he, he would, he would constantly, you know, he was just off by himself and he would, work on his lines and he would just eat lunch alone. And so one day I just decided, okay, I'm going to, I'm just going to go sit down next to him. And so I, it was kind of like as a, a dare sort of. And so I sat down and we just ate in silence and I would sort of go, you know, uh, you know, Hey, Hey Chris, I, you know, how, how you doing? And he would just sort of, he'd acknowledge me, you know, he'd shake his head but he wouldn't say, you know, he just keep eating. And then literally one day out of the blue, cause I kept doing this and amount of time went by and I just, how I, close I, are you sitting? You're sitting right next to him or across from him or diagonal. Right, but when I say sitting with him, I mean, right across from him. It was a matter of feet in between us. Oh. And, but he was just so, quiet and to himself that you know uh it, it, it's and it, we were and it was funny because we were doing scenes together 
Yeah. And he still wouldn't, you know, like it would be in between shots and, and I would talk to him. I would say hi, or I'd say whatever. And he would just kind of nod his head. And, but he was that way with the director too. He was that way with, with everybody. And then completely out of the blue, because it just seems like every Christopher Walken story has this similar kind of randomness to it. And it happened to me. I mean, it was all this time, no conversations, nothing. And then out of the blue, he just goes, um, and, and sorry for the terrible impression, but he, he was like, uh, he goes, Darren, what would you do? What would you say? to a girl if you wanted to ask her out on a date and, and i mean out of the blue just <laughs> out, what would i say and, and, and really? mind you every girl in any vicinity was drooling over him because he's just again it's it's who who he is and I mean, I, and i'm just sitting here going like what what the fuck do it but what's funny is that's what he wanted to talk about girls that huh. was the opening he wanted to talk he wanted to talk about girls and so what was funny was that's how i got my in and then i would dig into all the stuff i really wanted to get into i'd be like okay how many how you know how long did it take to shoot that scene in pulp fiction and what was deer hunter like and the, the you know the big scene with the russian roulette and so yeah that's my my uh my my christopher walken story but yeah that was that that was a trip damn that's badass so how long did it take to shoot that scene in pulp fiction God, I'm trying to remember, you know, it's, I, I, I wish I had, you know, I remember all the silly stuff. I don't remember any of the good, the, the, the gold he gave me, but you know, I don't remember. And, and, you know, I've yeah. seen so many uh, interviews and read so much stuff that who knows, I'm probably mixing it all up with, <laughs> okay. with what I've read anyway. So you, were you trying to be a professional actor and then how did, why did that fizzle out? Or are you still trying to be a professional actor? No, no, you know, yeah, I, Movies were my passion at a really, really young age. I was sort of an encyclopedia um, of of film at a at a real young age. At nine years old, I actually worked in a video store. Um, i I went to I went to school kind of far from where we lived. Um, Jeff would have been real young at the time, and I. I, uh, there was this little Circle K kind of, you know, uh, uh, gas station, you know, little sort of corner. And there was this mom and pop video store. And I used to hang out in it every day. I used to, you know, ride my skateboard, go in, and I would just look at uh, endless, you know, VHS and study everything. And I would memorize everything. I was in there so much that the owner, uh, he was this really sweet, uh, s sweet guy. His name was Frank. And he, and one day he just said, uh, and he barely spoke English. He, he spoke, uh, I think it was, I think he spoke Chinese and he just said, Hey, you're, you basically, he was like, you're in here every day. Uh, how about you alphabetize the tapes and I'll pay you in movies. And so he, uh, so I, I used to come there after school. I would alphabetize, I would organize. And then I got to take any movies I wanted home with me. So I was in love with film at a really young age. I got into acting. I did take it really seriously for a while. I was pursuing it. Um, and I was very passionate about it and, and, and all of that. What sort of took me away from acting was, uh, my also, uh, deep love of music. So, uh, mm -hmm. Um, my brother Jeff and I, we we um, we started playing music. Uh, we always kind of played music, but then it started getting more and more serious. So it, it I, weirdly, as my acting, or I was starting to work and starting to book stuff, and things were starting to happen. Like right at that time, my uh, passion, uh, our passion for music, just sort of took over, and so we ended up doing that pretty seriously for a while. And, uh, you know, we had a little record deal and we toured and did little, little tours and about as big as we ever got was, uh, you know, we were selling out the Troubadour and, and, um, playing some pretty decent venues and, and doing that. And, uh, 
then, uh, you know, that ended up, you know, we sort of, as we always say, we were sort of like the last, uh, the last group of people jumping on the Titanic. That was like right when a lot of, um, uh, we, we were every, everybody we were working with in the music industry was like fired overnight. Cause this was what like, oh, year is oh, this? this is like, Oh, five. Oh, you know, it was uh. like. Yeah, oh. there were still like A and R guys showing up to like venues, yeah, to, to like scout bands. Yeah, we time, had. You know? What was your band called? You had a record label and everything. We were called Hong Kong Six. So we got yeah. You can okay. find us on Spotify and iTunes and all of that. I'm I the singer guitar player Jeff uh, pl- uh, was the guitar player. He's saying eventually, harmonies. eventually we might break even on what we. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of music was it? You know, it was kind of. Um, like Pixies meets the police, kind of. Yeah, okay. it kind of yeah. had, yeah, it kind of had a, uh, yeah, it was kind of a weird, you know, it's a weird mix. Yeah, we got c- comparisons to like the Cars and okay. and the Pixies and and uh, um, yeah, it was sort of a, I don't know, it's kind of a kind of a hard hard one to describe. We were out in the era when a lot of the emo stuff was going on, but we weren't emo, and that wasn't mm. our. We weren't seeing kids, you know. Yeah, yeah. All my friends were seeing kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so we did that, and then yeah, it was sort of like all of our every band that we knew, every friend we had with that was in a band, every A and R person we knew, every manager. It was seemed like within a matter of months, everyone was let go, fired. The you know all the the labels sort of went under, mm. and uh, then yeah, then we, we Jeff went on to. Um, you know, UCLA, I, I started a family, had kids, got married, and it was a long, all through these years when Jeff and I were younger, we used to make short films. We used to, uh, we always made films, literally just to make our friends laugh and entertain each other. And we, we were just always hardcore, you know, exploitation fans and, and genre film fans. And, and, uh, and uh, over the years, we always said we wanted to write and we wanted to, um, you know, w- w- we sort of fantasized about actually writing a screenplay. And like four years ago, four or five years ago now, I guess, five years ago, literally, I just called Jeff one day and said, hey, I know we've always talked about it. You want to just not tell anybody and just do it? And he was like, yeah, let's do it. And that was it uh, that was i mean just com- we literally didn't tell other other than you know people very very close to us we pretty much didn't tell anybody and we wrote the retaliators and that well, was how did you learn how to write a script because i heard you say that you kind of put yourself through your own training did you yeah. actually watch a class or watch a video or read a book I, I also heard you say something like you watched or read hundreds of scripts which is insane to me so is that part of your own training or what else how did you le- there must be something because there's a very uh distinct format for writing scripts right very very distinct the rules are very sharp and tight and specific and yeah uh yes we um it was interesting part of what led to me to make the phone call to jeff was i had read an article where it said here are the ingredients you need to be a screenwriter and the first thing it said was you've got to read many scripts you have to actually sit and Mm. read scripts it's what people don't want to do and and i went oh well check because i grew up growing up as an actor i read hundreds of scripts and the interesting thing is that as an actor uh trying to get work and and all the pilot seasons and all of it 90 plus percent of all the scripts i read were very mediocre to bad you know it's very rare you read a really good script and uh the second thing was it said you've got to know film inside out and you've got to have you know real love for film i'm like okay well we're we're completely insane when it comes to that and then the third thing i think was something about knowing some fundamentals and that was like the one thing jeff and i didn't have and so we read many books we we took many we we watched an endless amount of lectures and uh interviews and 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 really really dove in because we knew we had a lot of things sort of uh piled up 
as far as our own education, but we knew it's like, okay, well, let's put some formal um, understanding into it. And, and, you know, Jeff, what, what were some of the stuff that resonated with you? Yeah. Well, I, yeah, especially when we first got into screenwriting, it was, I mean, it did seem like it was something magical that happens, you know, it's like you either have the magic or you don't or, or something like that. But I remember, so for many years, like, of course, I would have loved to have made a movie, but I, I didn't think I had that. Maybe I, I didn't have that kind of magic or whatever. Um, but I remember when you brought it up to me, like, hey, let's write a script. The first thing you directed me towards was a book written by Thomas Lennon and a Ben Garrett. And, yeah. and it's a great little book. It's like how to make you know I, it's I, kind of a sarcastic title it's like uh how to make money or how to profit i don't know when making movies or how something to like profit that. off <laughs> of making you know it's it yeah gosh i feel terrible i'm butch, butchering the yeah, title yeah, it's, it's like a, how it's such a great book how to have fun how to have fun and make a profit writing movies or something it's a it's kind of yeah. a sarcastic title <laughs> Um, but they what, made it really fun. Like, well, yeah. It, well, what it opened my eyes to was like, oh, okay, this is like anything else, you know. I mean, even with music, or there, there are tried and true ways of, you know, there are well worn paths to follow to like go. Okay, uh, this will guide me as I go along in doing this. So once we had that, it was like, oh, so we just, you know, we can come up with a story, characters, and you know, let's just try to fit it into these like molds that are out there of like, this is what a script should do. This is how a movie should go. You know, you have the opening image and inciting incident and, you know, so on and so forth. So, but once we started learning that, then we were like, okay, let's just try to tell a story and then we can go back and see if we can improve it using those sorts of things. And uh, yeah, that's, that, that was kind of how it was. What was cool about that book too, it's the top, again, Thomas Lennon and Ben Garrett. Uh, and it was recommended to us uh, from a screenwriter uh, uh, buddy of ours. We're really close with his name is Jerry Artukovich. And he 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 passed along the book. And, and what was so cool about it is a lot of books on writing are written by, you know, sort of professors and uh, teachers. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But what was interesting about Thomas Lennon and Ben Garrett is that I forget what their stat was. It's pretty crazy. They the movies they've written have literally made like over a billion dollars in Hollywood in the studio system. Uh, they wrote uh, on huge movies. You know, the Night at the Museum franchise. Thomas Lennon was the funny lead in uh, Reno Nine One One. I was going to say, yeah, I love yeah. that guy. Yeah, I, I, yeah, they're, both, yeah they're, he's both, they're both. Yeah, right, they're, yeah. they're, they're both, both hilarious. They're they're both, yeah. in, and so the book is actually written with their humor yeah and it's so underrated i never hear about it i never yeah. see because well, people talk about the big the big dogs yeah you know, like there's still the, in goldman oh, yeah i love those books yeah completely yeah, yeah and we read mckee and we read all the sort of classic <laughs> books just as because we knew we sort of had a lot of the informal training and so we just sort of fed our brains with all the more right. formal stuff too wow that's cool so when you're coming up um before retaliators was there other ideas that you had uh throughout the years i mean because that you know was inspired by a true story that didn't happen right. until later i mean if you've been a fan of movies since you're age nine was there other ones that you had in the care or do you still have some that maybe you're gonna make? <laughs> sure oh yeah yeah well but you know they were all you know aborted attempts you know what i mean we it, it was like getting it going and then you lose steam after like 20 pages or whatever or mm -hmm. you'd give like the first 30 pages to a friend who you really trusted that maybe was in the film industry and they would tear it apart and then you go well i guess i just suck hmm. you know what i mean and um and even when we started this process where we were taking it very seriously i was like looking at it like a craft as opposed to i just love movies let me write Mm -hmm. we, we started looking really as a, as a craft, you know, wanting okay. to build something that people could that are in the craft too can appreciate, you know, uh, uh, on that level. Um, we had some ideas that we ditched before the retaliators that didn't. A lot of it, we get so far, we'd end up in certain puzzles, and we, and then we'd get on to another idea, and then retaliators was just one that it kind of started like the other ideas where we thought. Um, oh, this is a great idea. And then we start fleshing it out. But as we started fleshing it out, it's like it just wouldn't stop. It was hmm. like, oh, no, that that leads to this great idea. That leads to that great idea. And then 
before we knew it, it was like we, I mean, we had a whole like universe of things that could be happening. It just became more of an issue of like, what's the exact story we want to tell now in this sort of universe we've we've built up um with all these characters. So yeah, that that's really where I felt like okay. Yeah, so you write this script and uh, I love the the script because it is like you say, you want to take a lot of like left turns and kind of keep people on their heels and, yeah. and that's what the script does. So then you upload it to this thing. I've never heard of this site, but it's called the blacklist, I guess. And it's where people can send in scripts and get rated. And this thing gets really wow. good reviews on that website. Yeah. The, the blacklist has been around since I think 2003. Um, it, it basically is a place where, um, Anyone can submit a script and it's uh, um, many films have been uh, dis it was it was originally this collection of scripts that uh, producers considered the best unproduced scripts around. And and from that came a lot of big films. So a lot of Oscar winners like Argo and Slumdog Millionaire. And I mean, honestly, the, the, the examples of what's come out of the blacklist go on and on and on. And so it it became this, this uh, big deal for writers because it was sort of a way for anybody to be from the outside and submit now the way and also blind coverage it's blind coverage you know, so it's, it's yeah. really like peer reviewed in a, in a sense mm -hmm. you know like so they, they they're not if you're an unknown writer you can get legitimate coverage on, on yes. your work which is but yes. how do you get people to even read it to begin because it's got to get somebody's got to actually read the script so these well, there's people it. out there that do that yeah so They'll there's read anything that well so that's how the blacklist works you have to pay money and the, they're oh, notoriously okay. difficult to get a high rating. So okay. what it's so the our, again our friend Jerry he had because we we when we finished it we said okay what do we what do we do with this thing and he was like well you could send it to the blacklist and he was like you know you're going to get torn apart on there but hey you'll learn a lot about what you did wrong and what you can improve on and I, I, we said okay cool we turned it in and the last thing we expected was for us to get these high ratings and get on their top it's called getting on their top list when you hit above a certain rating and what it means is now producers and people can discover your script and so that's exactly uh that's exactly what happened we put the script up we got this incredible coverage, uh, incredible ratings. We were that what that's kind of where the beginning of the shocks all started with this, um, and have gone on from there. Um, but yeah, that we, nobody was more surprised than us. We were expecting this is garbage and this is what's wrong. And and next thing you know, we had offers coming in. We had we were getting emails with we'd like to option this script and we'd like to meet you guys. And we're sitting there going, what the heck, you know? So that's, yeah, that's where it started. Yeah. And then you send it to your friend, Michael Lombardi, who you knew from music. Yeah, um, He said he was born to play this role. What was it about that role that spoke to him so much about the character? You know, he, uh, it, it was a, to, to say he was passionate from the beginning would just be <laughs> such an understatement. Yes. We, at the exact same time that we started getting all these all this interest, we sent the script to him because he called me completely out of the blue, and I sent him the script. And literally within three days, he was on a plane, flew from the East Coast uh, over to us uh, uh, in Southern California, and he just uh, uh, he just said, "I." was born to play this role he connected he got all of the references and all of the nuances and there were lots and lots of little winks to a lot of our and homages to a lot of things and a lot of films and sort of subgenres. and and he just got it and he just really understood you know the character we created john bishop is a really kind of like a throwback character in that he's not cynical at all he's a, he's in earnest almost like a like a jimmy stewart frank cap a good guy in a frank capra movie you know he's he's a legitimate um 
we we didn't want any sort you know any sort of um like hidden nefarious background you know that he's hiding beneath his you know yeah cloth you know yeah. in, in, in we, his closet or something it was like tom, like like tom hanks early tom right. hanks or you know frank capper like that sort of thing and he just got it and then the other weird part about the character was that we would, it was written in the script that that when he was uh, at his at at his uh the in the first church scene it said he's a rock he's, he's a pastor it says he's a rock star in this little corner of the universe the whole community kind of gathers around him and loves him and he's sort of uh and he he got that he connected with that and when you watch his his performance in the film i mean he just he embodied it so uh just so perfectly and and uh i mean we were there on the set watching it and it was unbelievable to watch yeah so explain how because he had to help direct it because it was filmed during the lockdown or whatever so and there's like three directors so explain how you shot that with three directors that must have been tough yeah though it, it was uh to say tough it is is again another crazy understatement because it was just when we say early days of lockdown, I mean, it was, we were in the forest uh, when March of 2020 hit, Mar you know, the, when lockdown literally happened. So it, everything in the world was chaos. Well, obviously being right in the middle of shooting a film, our film went into chaos uh, for a very long time. And, and it meant uh, you know, cast coming and then dropping out at the last second and directors not being able to shoot anymore and us having to change coasts and travel restrictions and just sort of endless, you know, we would, we would, um, we would get every, you know, build up for, for months to get to a shoot and have everything prepared. And at the last second, we'd get a phone call and it'd be like, okay, we need you to look at that scene, but now this person can't make it because of X, Y, Z, this person can. So I need you to now connect. I, I, we would get these writing puzzles that you couldn't imagine. Uh, but thankfully, truly thankfully, because of Michael being the, the guy that was always there and carrying the torch through all of the, the, the craziness, he was able to, we were able to constantly and, and bounce ideas off of him and we collaborate with him just incredibly well. And then we also had a, a brilliant editor in, in Randy mm -hmm. Greger. Uh, okay. and it, he really helped us connect um, a lot of, a lot of what, what you see. So, you know, it was, it's hard to explain. It was just an endless amount of trials and tribulation. And, and, you know, that's making any movie. So it was a, um, it was, it, we, it, we were chock full of, of, of adventures. <laughs> no, that's interesting. You bring up the editing. I was just watching this thing. Cause they just came out with a, I don't know if you're a fan of planes, trains and automobiles, but it's one of my oh. favorite movies. <laughs> and they came out with too. like, I guess there's like an hour of, of uh, deleted yeah. scenes Yes. And uh, I haven't seen it. I mean, I've seen some of the bits uh, on YouTube, people discussing it, but I just find that so fascinating that they edited out an hour of extra footage. And I think they, they did the right thing though, because the, the, yeah. the cut of the film is in the pacing and all that is so perfect, but that's gotta be so hard to, to cut out scenes that are, they say like these scenes are really funny, but it, it doesn't move the story along. So that's a yeah. really underrated right. job. I think who, who's your editor again, Randy, who his name's Randy Bricker. And Andy Bricker, he, okay. Yeah, and you talk about a, a legend. I mean, he literally has been in these are all the franchises he's edited films in. Halloween franchise. Wow. Hell, Hellraiser, two child's plays, uh Texas a Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And he actually is the editor on the Chucky series right now, too. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Um, yeah. So this guy's just got incredible, incredible uh, talent. And yeah, editing is just everything. And especially when you've got a movie, our movie has some, there's some complexities going on. There's some, like you were saying, there's some turns that need to happen. There's multiple, uh, you know, genres that are sort of blended and so mm -hmm. yeah the editing is was absolutely crucial yeah so i mean i had michael on and, and he was telling the story uh 
of uh, your sister, the, the, what's, which not, it's not a true story movie, but it's inspired by the right. true story of what happened to your sister. And he explained that whole thing. And, um, you know, she was attacked and raped, a horrible thing. And they catch the guy 10 years later. Um, I was just curious, like, did the, did the police give any advice with something like that? Like, how can people prevent an attack like that? Was there anything that she could have done? Or is there anything that she does now? Like, does she carry pepper spray or a gun or like what kinds of, I mean, that's just such a horrible thing. Like, how can we prevent that from ever happening? Right. You know, that's a, that's such a good question, Chuck. And, you know, it makes me, it makes me realize I, I, I actually would like to know the answer to that. Um, you know, I, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know what from, from a sort of police standpoint, what the, um, advice would be, you know, what had happened was, uh, yeah, she was walking home alone pretty close to her house and was tackled into a ravine. You know, I, 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 it, I don't know, you know, it's certainly, I, I don't think pe things like pepper spray can hurt. I don't think, uh, I think tr trying to not be alone in the middle of the night, obviously right. has got to be, uh, w would it have been different if she was with a friend, you know, and what's hard is that in this situation, she wasn't walking miles away from her house. So it's very reasonable to think, yeah. oh, this is my neighborhood and I'm I'm just up the street. But yeah. it just it just shows you, you know, uh, so, you know, I, I don't know. That's a really good question. I, I don't have a actual like, you know, <laughs> technical answer, but sure. Yeah, I'm sure there's tips and things that people can yeah. do. I was just curious if they told you anything, because uh, so like in the scene in the movie, there's a scene where the detective tells the dad about what happens to his daughter. Is that something that you guys had to live? Like, did a, a detective have to tell you about your sister or did a family member call or how did you guys find out about it? No, no, we found out through, um, I, I, my sister tells the story of her, uh, of our dad having to go to the hospital because see, she was, she went out into the road. She flagged down a car. They called an ambulance. She was taken to the hospital. Again, remember, this was the middle of the night. Mm. And this was, I don't think she had a cell phone. I, I don't mm -hmm. think she had a cell phone on her. And she was left for dead, right? Because the guy strangled oh, yeah. her. And yes. he thought, he probably thought he killed her. Oh, no, no. It was, it was, uh, the, uh, the, 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 she, he was, convicted of attempted it was attempted murder because mm -hmm. it was uh no question it was a belt around her neck and yeah she uh she had to be very clever to get out of the situation alive yeah. uh, it's typically not a not a thing most people survive that kind of attacks that kind of stranger attack um so yeah so that scene happened with in real life um uh, my dad actually showed up at the hospital and, you know, I've and, and it's interesting bringing up my dad because it was through having conversations with him that is was the original impetus for the retaliators uh, plot. You know, the idea of what if there was a service for family members uh, that of, of family members of crime victims? What if they were offered uh the opportunity for a minute alone. Mm -hmm. uh, it was in having conversations with, not because my dad was talking about wanting that. It was just hearing his pain and hearing his, you know, I'd always been on my side of it being a brother. And then it's like to imagine being a father, it was talking to my dad that really got me going, oh God, you know, that's a whole other level. And then that sort of just came out organically. Yeah. There's, there just seems something very, you know, I, I kind of connect the um, like, even every time I hear the story of what happened, the part that makes me, you know, really sympathize somewhat, you know, with, with the Jed character is it's the belt, you know, there's something deeply sadistic about yeah. somebody wanting to inflict harm on innocent people that way and wanting to kill them. Uh, and I felt the same way about the zip ties. It's like once yeah. you see the zip ties of the retaliators, it's like there's just something that's extra cruel and sadistic and sort of uh, about that. And um, yeah, it was, it was really hard. Yeah, like you said, it's not the movie is certainly 
it gets pretty fantastical by the third act. So it's certainly not yes, a, not a true story, no, but no. the inspirations, the the inspiration, you 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 see the Easter eggs when you know um, the story enough. When Jody saw the movie for the first time, she was she was just tickled at all the the different. She got it. She saw left and right all the different. And some things are very on the nose. There's a character named Jody in the movie, uh, but but there's other things that are are sort of symbolic and and uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. What was the line? Uh, there was a shot, something about the politician. Uh, he had no balls because he let one of the guys get out of jail early. Like, do you <laughs> think that is some is an issue right now with uh, with some people being too soft on crime? No, no, no. no I mean, that really. that character was sort of a you know um you know that character sort of you know, here's what we what we went into this to the script with and we i think we stayed really true to it throughout the entire making of the film which i'm one of the things i know both of us are really proud of you know we did not want to in any way telegraph any sort of message or any sort of um we didn't want to moralize no about, we, didn't, we didn't want to moralize or or, or, or ideal like here's our political message yeah. and here's the here's the film that's going to carry it <laughs> I, you know what i mean we're just our aesthetic when it comes to film and cinema like we love you know it's you know it's like, like jaw, that, jaws yeah. and 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 it's it's uh i, I we, we're, we're really big into cinema for the sake of entertainment there's a place for cinema that that is there to sort of you know maybe make you think about life in a different way or or to sort of you know pose very kind of grand questions um we're just sort of fans of of having things be understated and sort of in a way fair in a way sort of just open and not not judge it we we knew letting characters be the characters yeah instead of using them as a as a, like a a microphone for our own yeah you know, voice on an issue you know <laughs> no, it's like it is I want to are, yeah i want to and i and i understand like that's something that happens in the film right the guy gets released from prison um but that being said i i didn't really see it as i mean certainly things like that i mean not as exaggerated but certainly things like that happen or and can happen you know the justice system doesn't seem to uh work you know uh where maybe someone who's committed a violent crime gets away with the violent crime you know well yeah i thought because i felt like that third act was a whole commentary on the prison system how the people are turned into mindless beasts and like it was yeah. just you know like it kind of made you think like is it more humane to maybe just have these people, you know, have the death penalty, or is it is it better to have right, them in, right, in right. life in prison? And if they are in prison, I mean, is that kind of like, I mean, that's yeah, like, yeah. If I, in this movie, I would rather just be dead than be in that. Well, yeah, that's in a, in a way, I I, I yeah. like your reading because it's it's almost saying like, hey, criminals, wouldn't you just rather die? <laughs> Than go to prison, you know. I mean? Well, that like, prison, I mean, especially supposed to be pro uh, yeah, death penalty yeah. or something. But yeah. no, I don't think we were we were going into it like, hey, I'm pro death. But I've actually, I don't think I've ever really. We've never gotten into like a discussion over like the morality of the death. Yeah, penalty. I thought that was the whole thing of the movie. It was like it was like this no. struggle with a guy, like you know, w when you're pushed to do the right because he's trying to be a good yeah. person. He's right, always trying right. to do the right thing, yeah. and then he's pushed. It's like eventually sometimes you can't always be a nice guy sometimes you got to fight back and that's kind right. of what I, what I gather from the movie yeah. is kind of the message not that i know it's a light film it's fun and it's right, uh right, you know there's right. eyeballs being popped out so i mean there's you know it's funny it's like it's, <laughs> it shouldn't be taken too seriously well, but at the same but, time it's like it does kind of bring up that issue i think but but chuck what i what i love i love that you you're you have things that you're taking from it and things that are speaking to you and I think that that's really cool because, right. uh, you know, the we we made the decision to we wanted these. Uh, yeah. Things like, you know, death penalty and justice and morality. We knew we were playing with these things. We wanted to just truly show these two characters, uh, two characters that were sort of mirrors of each other that 
both come from a good place, but they made very different decisions, went different ways. And we really just, you know, now trauma warps people. Yeah. Too, you yeah. Know, and, can, you know, we, we, we wanted reactions. it to be something that you kind of wrestled your mind around with and something that you could discuss afterwards and, and get into conversations like this, because uh, these are tricky conversations, you know, right. th th looking at issues like the death penalty when I'm hearing you going through those reasons, what prison can turn people into prison, you know, yeah. issues like prisons and, and ref, cr criminal reform and, and, and death penalty. These are difficult issues. These aren't easy uh, fixes. You know, there's a lot of nuance there. Right. And when you start oh. entering emotion into it and trauma into it, and when it hits close to home and then you, yeah, you know, those are all, um, uh, you know, so, so I, yeah, I, I love that you're, you're taking things from it, but yeah, that our intention was never to have a actual message be transmitted <laughs> out. You know, that's I just, just feel like it's the, the world today. It's just, we see everything through a lens like that, where, uh, you know, how things are going with it, like with crime and stuff with prison. I mean, I just, I find that topic so fascinating. I've had people yeah, on here too. that have that have worked with, uh, you know, that they've promoted charities that try to help prisoners. And I mean, right. it's just an interesting topic where you see uh, crime, uh, you know, rising up in some of these cities, even here in Phoenix, like we've seen it. Uh, and the homeless thing is a big issue too. So it's just like, when I see that in the movies, I'm like, oh, this is interesting. Like they're kind of yeah. playing with these. And yeah, I don't know that you necessarily take a stance either way, but it's definitely something yeah. that makes you think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because we don't even I mean, we really don't even get into like, you know, the cause of criminality and all that kind of stuff. Like, it's never really about, you know, I, again, I just don't think we were trying to make a, a definitive statement on, but kind of putting the issues on the table and show you some characters who made interesting choices about well, and, and the and other... seeing, and seeing <laughs> how it kind of goes for them. <laughs> the the other thing, too. One guy learns something about himself, yeah. you know, not to always be a pacifist. The other guy learns that. You know, maybe he never learns it. You know, I don't, it's debatable whether Jed really learns his lesson. Where, you know? where you, where, where this debate always, and this, these kind of topics always get very tricky is once you start digging into things like, you know, um, uh, drug, you know, drug related offenses or, um, you know, nonviolent crime or maybe crimes of passion, things like that. <clears throat> what it's probably we, like the majority of crime what, if you think about it what know? we what we Out very desperation yeah and, you know. well what i think we, also forgiveness too is a is some yeah. like i just had the guy i don't are you, are you guys familiar with static x and oh yeah uh, oh yeah. yeah okay so you know the guitar player you know his story like how like yeah. he okay yeah so <laughs> google this one but yeah he was he was in a lot of trouble because he he had sex with like a 16 year old girl or something he was arrested he went to jail He's oh, been wow. out. He's been out of prison. He's been yeah. uh, clean and, and not d committed any crimes for like 15 years or something like that. I had him on my show. And of course, I, I got backlash for that. Uh, but, you know, and I kind of was like I, I was on the fence about doing it. But, uh, you know, my good friend uh, put in a word, said, look, he's he's changed. He's a different man. So it's like, at what point do you let people? That's what kind of makes me think about do you believe people can be rehabilitated or do we just give everybody the death penalty? Like, I don't know. It's kind of an interesting debate. Well, well, well that, what I was, yeah. what I was going to say was uh, what we purposefully did in the retaliators was we made the bad guys so extreme. And Cartoonish. So, yeah. yeah. Just cartoon. I mean, apps, yeah. I mean, when you listen to the list of crimes that, you know, the, the Jacoby's character, perpetrated in the film i mean it's it truly is sort of out, outrageous and 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 it very unlikely anybody like him would ever get released um yeah. uh, no matter what kind of re rehabilitation program so the there there is you know jeff and i have gotten into conversations about there's sort of a like jeff said <clears throat> the majority of kind of criminals and and kind of crimes and then there are that very, very small percentage of very extreme cases where I think universally, most people, most people would have agreement that, yeah, that person is a monster. You know, Ted Bundy right. was a monster. Uh, Jeffrey Dahmer was a monster. Ed Kemper was a monster. Uh, people who, you know, there are heinous 
crimes, uh, you know, and, and what was interesting was, yeah, like with our sister's attack, thank God she lived. Yeah, obviously. But <clears throat> the kind of attack that she went through was one of those very, very extreme fringe kind of crimes. Right. Because you just a total stranger that when you think it's so hard to wrap your brain around, mm -hmm. this is a stranger doing tackling a teenage yeah. girl and raping her and trying to kill her uh, down on the side well, of the road. I mean, it's unbelievable. And what is wild too, is like, you think, you know, somebody like that now, uh, granted he's being at the age he's at, he's being put away at an age that, you know, I, you know, he, he, it's very probable he won't make it to the end of it, you know, for, for a chance of parole. But you look at a crime like that and I, you know, whatever your um, sort of like philosophical inc inclinations are about it, wherever you think it's like the true justice of the situation, especially the closer you are to the situation, you can't help but feel like this guy should never see the light of day right. ever again. You know what I mean? And no. really, I think the movie where where the movie captivated me early on was was that thing of like there is a lot there's a weird zone in which you can think like you can totally reason yourself into thinking, OK, that's the right thing to do. But I can't help but feel like I want to do so I want to do something else. Right. <laughs> you know right, what I mean? Right, it's like yeah. I can't shake the feeling like I want to, you know, make sure that person feels pain, even though I think the justice system is, you know, there for a good reason. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's okay. You know, it's almost feeling like you're the exception, you know what I mean? Because, gosh, nobody, it's easy for everybody to say, like, this person should just go to jail, do their time, and be released. You know what I mean? Because it didn't happen to them. It's right. not that person. Yeah. Right. And that's what we were kind of tapping into. That's what we that, wanted to tap into. Is it, that feeling. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The, the p victims of crime and families of victims are going to be able to relate to that for sure. Yeah, big yeah. time. Yeah. yeah. So sorry to get too deep and philosophical. No, no, it's, me, uh, actually, it's that's it, our wheelhouse. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's, okay, cool. fun, it's fun to yeah. to get into it. Yeah. So let me lighten it up a little bit though. So it's interesting because yeah. the third act is actually teased at the beginning of the movie. And um, I don't have a problem with that. I think that's I love that. I love a little tease at the beginning where you're like, what? What's going on? And then it like, but here I here's something that I've noticed with a lot of movies and TV shows. Tell me if you guys think this is an issue. Everybody wants to do like a Pulp Fiction where all the scenes are completely out of order. Sometimes there's like multiple timelines going and it's just getting so confusing. Why is every movie and TV show doing that? Have you noticed that too? Good question. Yeah. yeah. No, totally. I it, Look, we, we it's funny you bring up Pulp Fiction because I think Quentin Tarantino is certainly a hero to us as he is sure. to many filmmakers. But not everybody's Pulp Fiction or not, not everybody's not that. every script is How, that kind of story. Yeah. A lot of these stories are just they yeah. just need to be linear. They don't need to be jumping around. It doesn't make right. any sense. It, it, it's all about, you see, for us, the and there is a little bit of rule breaking in the retaliators. Maybe that's an understatement in terms of like flashbacks. And we do have a little bit of a disordering thing. But we looked at, I, I always have taken, you know, Quentin Tarantino's advice to heart in anything we write, which is when you're writing a story, even if you're doing, I know he doesn't do outlines, but even if you're doing outlines and all that, you know, you it, you're, you have a story, let it unfold organically, you yeah. know, and I think the way that we wrote it, it felt organic. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? I'm glad they didn't go back. You didn't go back and forth. And I, I just, that's no, my pet peeve with we movies and TV shows now. We weren't trying to be clever for the sake of being clever. We, yeah. we had yeah. a story we wanted to tell and we wanted it obviously. And we, we were putting all of our effort into letting it unfold in an interesting way, you know? And so I, well, think, and I, that was I the, think one of the things where we're guiding light. Yeah. And, and where, where I hear you, Chuck is, is, and I feel like this is, being done to death these days is every movie or show starting at this later action point and then then coming back and then actually starting the story and then you don't know you know how long it's going to take till you get there they, they jump from so many different i think it was yeah. uh, maybe and i love the jeffrey dahmer show but i feel like that might have been one of them where they jumped around so there's so many shows yeah. like that 
where they jump around so much, yeah. you're you're confused. And I'm it's like, like well, yeah. another one, yeah. even though I really loved it, was the one about that serial killer in uh, Europe. Uh, it was like the snake one. Oh, oh the, the serpent. The serpent. It was great. Yes. That's was, another one. Yeah. I, I was confused for like yeah. the first three yeah. episodes. Like, where am I on the yeah. timeline? Yeah. Like, I, I, this is captivating, but just yeah. let me know where I am, goddamn. Yeah, yeah that's well, true. Yeah. I just don't see the point of it. So I'm glad you guys didn't do that. I like the tease is cool. I like that. That's like one tease yeah, is yeah. good. But yeah, people overuse that. Um, so one thing that uh that was cool about the movie too is that it makes it a throwback. It was the soundtrack being a big part of it. And then you've got the rock stars in the roles and stuff. But you know, another thing that I thought was kind of interesting that was symbolizes that it was a bit of a throwback and it kind of an eighties movie is that you actually show nudity. That is not something that's done a lot in movies. Is that a decision that was written into the script or is that a director thing? It was a hundred percent written. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we, uh, yeah we love our nudie movies, yeah, we, you know, of the eighties. I mean, that's like, like who, tits. let's go. Ask yeah. Them. That was like a fun part of like, I you know, a throwback of the eighties. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, we, you know, we're, we're big fans of the, you know, the Canon, you know, Canon yeah. films, uh, exploitation, you know, the eighties. We love the seventies stuff too, but you know, we, yeah, you know, there's definitely, uh, and it's interesting. Like TV we, goes into nudity. TV does, but, you know, yeah. films have really, yeah, yeah and, and I just feel like movies have just become so sanitized. Yeah. And, yeah. you yeah. know, we really, um, from the beginning, knew we wanted to make something dirty, grimy, <laughs> have it go places, have it maybe a little questionable at points. Yeah, you know, <laughs> like, you know. Um, and, and the movie's actually dialed back from how extreme <laughs> the 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 script got. Uh, you know, but uh as Jeff said, we wrote out kind of a larger universe. So we we definitely if if we end up doing sequels or anything, we'll we'll have plenty to get to. But yeah, no, we you know, the strip clubs were written in, like we wanted it to be that sort of throwback uh, feeling. Uh, it just creates an instant vibe when you just get that, whoa, uh, there's there's nudity or there, right, it's the right. language or it's this, you know, the sort of the gore. content. The, the gore, gore is cool. You know? yeah. 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 Especially because um, it's not, it's it's not shown in a in a like a realistic like oh my god no. freak. it's like a cartoonish kind of totally. yeah I like it yeah because yeah if you think about the nudity too it wasn't like trying to be super uh, naturalistic about it and you know like it's this is fun pretty, it's like it's fun. Fun. It's fun. fun nudity yes. you know what I mean this is like you know yeah. I mean? yeah that's what I, and I think that's what you were picking up on the. Uh, I think that's what you mean when you said you picked up on the throwback element through the nudity. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's so much of the movie. The use just, of the nudity. Yeah. That's the main emphasis. Yeah, I'm trying to find these deeper philosophical issues in it. But but on the surface, it's just a fun movie. And I think yeah, people great. Are, no, I yeah. appreciate you picking up on that. I mean, as a as a child of the eighties and nineties, I just I feel like uh we look back all the time and just go, Boy, we were so spoiled. We just the the movies we had, the the bands, the music, it was just, they're definitely I feel like they're, and we, we do, you know, we've been doing a lot of interviews and, and, and I feel like there's a lot of people feeling the same way we've gotten, you know, when we put the, when the movie was getting close to getting put out before it went into film festivals, I mean, we literally looked at each other and just went, boy, is anybody going to get this? Are they going to just run away and go, this is, you know, uh, offensive or not, you know, w w you know, this is, I mean, we've have had our detractors. Well, certainly, <laughs> certainly, 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 uh, no, no question. But, but, but you know what, but, it feels we, like water off a, yeah, we, know, we, off a goose's back. Yeah, we, 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 uh, <laughs> we, 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 we would have never expected 88% on Rotten Tomatoes. We would have never expected 30 plus uh, film festivals and winning awards. I think people, you know, we're fine. Not everybody, you know, and it's fine. That's the great thing about art and, and film and music. It's not everything is supposed to be for everybody. Right. You know, it's, right. it's right. called, you know, change the channel. If you're not you know. excluding some people in a movie, it's like, you're, what are you you're doing? You're doing something wrong. You know I mean? yeah, yeah. But I think that's a very underrepresented uh, uh, category of film right now is guy movies. Like for movies, for right. guys like me, yeah. like, you know, mid forties, like, Grew yeah. up in the child of the '80s and '90s, like wants like a fun guy movie. There's just not that many uh, that yeah. I can think of. So this was yeah. one that I'm like, oh, this is what I like. You know, this is a kind of like fun horror action 
uh, totally. movie twists and turns. It's like I think people enjoy. It. I think I think it's girls will like it too. No, yeah. no, I I think it's a really fun aesthetic because I don't see myself as like anything near like a macho man or like a very masculine kind of guy. But I love, but the masculine aesthetic in film is very fun. It's fun watching Clint Eastwood movies. I love yeah. dirty. I'm not anything near dirty. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's why it's fun dirty. to see it. Yeah, fun yeah. to see it. The, it's a it's a character type. You know what I mean? And it, yeah, we, you know, we we don't see a lot of that these days. But I, yeah. you know, it, yeah. it's certainly an aesthetic. We, I mean, we're both huge like Bronson fans. We're big Bronson and you know. Chuck Norris and Clint Eastwood. The Ram, you know, I mean, the yeah. movie. The, that's the other funny homage in the movie, and it's not there subtly. There's references to Die Hard, references to Terminator Rambo. and Rambo. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's very much a love letter, the the arc that the character goes through. We wanted it to feel at the beginning of the movie like this would be the least likely person that could turn into an action hero that's actually kicking actual ass in the movie. But, you know, Michael, again, credit to him pulling it off. I mean, the fight scenes at the end and the... Right. Uh, all the stunts and everything that was all him and uh and and it, it i feel like it worked really well but yeah we agree i mean i, I there's just uh i think you know we're, we're happy to fill that void because i i think it is it is missing right now i think it is you know just sort of just having films there for the sake of entertaining yeah and, not, know, not all films are propaganda you know and i think that's in people who enjoy films they understand this like you can watch these characters and it's not a training manual <laughs> on how to go out in the world and behave right exactly yeah. no, 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 no. It's supposed to be fun. you can throw, you you can know? throw on commando and predator and everything's going to be okay you know? oh. <laughs> like here's how we need you to behave in the world okay we need right. you to torture people and, and punch you know punch people out you know Right. No, I love it. So then how did you guys pick? That's my, my only thing, though, that's kind of not throwback is the soundtrack is actually more modern. So how did you guys pick the music? Well, we didn't. Yeah, pick, we didn't. Yeah, oh, we you didn't, didn't pick the music. We didn't pick the not music. Us not us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. not us personally. Um, that was, you know, very much th the brainchild of Alan Kovac, who is the um, who, who owns Better Noise. Oh, and, right. OK, because he had to produce it, right? Correct. Yes. So Michael brought when Michael and Michael Lombardi basically came to Jeff and I and said, I'll get your film made. Um, and one, you know, one of the people he went to was Alan Kovac. And that was the person he went to, really. And it was, you know, uh, he showed him the script and Alan had just had success putting out the dirt, he, which he co-produced um for for netflix obviously which was a huge hit on on netflix and so he was he had kind of gotten you know uh gotten in 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 you know gotten the bug doing that and then when he read the retaliators his vision was well at first it was let's go for a big soundtrack let's you know let's do that again because like you said it's such a great throwback that just again another thing we miss uh, dearly and loved growing up with all those cool you know lost boys and last action hero and, and you know all the, all that stuff and uh then it turned into well then what what if they had small roles in the film and so a lot of a lot of TLC went into that. You know, we spent a lot of time looking at the roles, what would make sense. And and Michael put a lot of attention into curating that. And we had definitely input. And uh, so as far as the roles and as far as the songs, we had input, but it was definitely, you know, the idea was, um, you know, to, to really, you know, take a modern kind of approach, which I think is cool because I think if it would have all been, you know, I'm, you're talking to like the biggest, uh, you know, I'm, I've been a metal head my whole life and I love all kinds of metal, but certainly the classic hard rock and, and, um, you know, eighties metal and, and, and stuff like that is, is very near and dear so I certainly would have loved going in in that kind of direction, but then it would have really made the movie a full throwback. And the movie's not set in the '80s, you know; it's set mm -hmm. in modern times. And so, you know, I think the modern 
the modern songs, it, it, it makes it cool. And look, you know, Nikki Six wrote our theme song, which it's a great theme song. I, yeah. I, I, Thanks, man. I, thank, we're really proud of. It. I mean, we're proud that he wrote it and that he made it. Let, let me let me tell you. Let me tell you. And was it James Michael singing on that? Because I had him on my show. It was no. Uh, it's it, James Spencer, Michael wrote it yeah. with, wrote, with, okay. with like Nikki, and uh, the singers on it are Spencer Charnas from Ice Nine Kills. Yeah. Um, it's multiple bands. Okay. Uh, the yeah. Guy from cool. uh, from from Ashes. To, you know. So anyway, uh, asking Alexandria, and then of course, of course, Motley Crue, and the um, I, I as I said, if the if you could have told the how, however old I was, twelve year old me, when I had at twelve or thirteen, I had Nikki Six. That was like my guy when I was into the crew, and I just had Nikki Six all over my walls. I was Nikki Six for Halloween. I used to shoot oh. videos where I did the I did the paint and I you know acted like I was playing the bass. And so if you would have told twelve year old me that I would write a script one day and he would write the theme song, I mean, I just it was beyond a dream come true when that happened. That's awesome. And then so there is going to be a sequel, or are you already kind of halfway through that, or we we have one outlined. So we're okay. yeah we're hoping that we do. We'll see we'll see how it goes. Uh, but is there a threshold of money you have to make or something or what? You know I don't know what the exact threshold would be, but I mean we're doing really well on VOD. So I uh, you know I think if we just continue to do well. And then when we go to streaming, when Blu-ray comes out, you know, because we've got all those things coming up that oh, I, okay. I, I think we'll be heading there. Yeah. So we'll well. be streaming. It'll be like people can find on Netflix or Hulu or one of those coming up. Yeah, we're on VOD everywhere right now. Uh, everywhere you buy and rent movies within the next couple of months, we're going to be going to Blu-ray. And yeah, we will be coming to streaming. I'm not sure where yet, but they're okay. working all that stuff out now. And then we'll be going uh, international as well. So we'll be going all, all over. Cool. All right. Well, I look forward to hopefully there's a, could be a sequel. You guys come back on the show. Heck yeah. We'd love to. Too. Yeah. And then, um, I always end each episode promoting a charity. Is there a charity that's uh, near and dear to your heart that you want to give a shout out to? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we, we definitely, uh, would love to, um, there's, uh, there, it's called the ADAA. It's Anxiety and Depression Association of America. Um, what's great about them is, um, in 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 sort of tribute to Jody, um, because the attack was one thing, but it was it, uh, was as horrendous as that was. The PTSD that followed was was uh, something that went on for a very long time. It was a huge trial for her, to say the least. Um, so uh, ADAA is a great resource for people dealing with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder of any kind. Um, there's, uh, you know, lots of lots of resources and there's, you know, phone numbers and crisis lines, uh, a lot of information there. The other reason uh we chose that is because uh, the one of the primary things they deal with as well is anxiety disorder uh myself and uh jeff and we depression. are we, yeah. depression of course but yeah i, I i'm a card carrying uh, anxiety disorder um a person that i i have been for most of my life i've been managing it uh well i know jeff's lived with it for a long time too so uh, what I really appreciate about appreciate about uh, ADAA is when I had first had anxiety disorder. This was in the I was young, and this was in the '90s. There were there were no resources or very very little. Panic disorder was only coined as a term, I believe, in the medical field, like around 1992. And so, uh, when I had it, it was at a time where the internet was very, very, you know, barely around and uh, the terms were barely around. These days, you see commercials everywhere, you know, you see you, the, the terms are used a lot, but uh, I would have given anything to have the resources that are there uh, for people. So make sure, you know, again, there's phone numbers, there's things you can download, um, uh, there's direct uh links to get to therapists and so it's yeah it's people okay. that 
know about anxiety disorder. Definitely a lot of a lot of love for for any any uh, help in that area. Absolutely. Well, I'll put that link in the show notes along with the Retaliators website, and uh, people should check out the movie now. Or if they want to wait for streaming, I guess they could wait as it should be coming. Not they should not wait. They need to go get it right now. <laughs> okay, right now, right now. All right. Why so, wait? <laughs> yes. All right. Well, thanks so much, guys. It's been a blast. Uh, I'll get this episode up soon. Thank you, Chuck. Thanks, man. Really thanks cool. for right. having us, man. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Thank you. Have a good one. You too. Bye bye. My thanks again to the Gear Brothers. Check out the film The Retaliators. I've watched it twice now. I think it actually gets better with repeated viewing. Very entertaining, fun movie. If you like the old school '80s horror action movies. I think you'll dig it. And uh, please help get the word out by posting about the film on social media or sharing this interview, and then you can help both of us out. Uh, I appreciate all your support. Have a great day and shoot for the moon.